Hey yo, I'm back. For those of you who know, yes, I was in China for the past two weeks. It was wonderful. Expect videos about that coming up soon. But for now, I have to film this book review video because otherwise I will forget. I've done it before. So this is my top 10 books of the year. The top 10 books that I read this year out of a total of 83. I read too many books. I have no life. I've forgiven myself for that, so it's okay. It's really hard to narrow down 83 into a top 10, so my top 10 books has 11 books in it, and I think that that's okay. We are gonna start with 11th place, The Story of More by Hope Jaren. This book is so interesting, and it's so cool too. It's basically looking at how our food production in the world has increased pretty much at the same rate of our population size. It talked about GMOs, and it was really fascinating. I feel like GMOs have always been this like, ooh, scary, spooky stuff type of word. And actually seeing what they are and what they do, it's not that scary. It's quite interesting and cool. I want the GMOs injected right into my blood, scientists. Here's a quote from that book that I want to share. All of the want and suffering in the world all of it arises not from the Earth's inability to produce, but from our inability to share. And I thought that that was an excellent, very condemning sentence. Anyways, in 10th place, we have The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017, by Rashid Khalidi. And let me tell you something about this book. It's excellent. I actually read this before. All the stuff went down in October and everything that's gone down since October, the continued violence and slaughter of civilians. This is a good book if you are somebody who feels like, oh, the conflict in Israel and Palestine, it's so complicated, it's so hard to grasp, it's really difficult to have an opinion on that. You should read this book because it really lays out how Israel is a settler colonial state uh, set up by the British after World War II. There were already people living on the land. What followed was ethnic cleansing, occupation, oppression, apartheid, and a lot of killing. It puts it all in a really, really blatant perspective so that you can't just say, oh, it's so complicated anymore, you can actually see, oh, the Palestinians are trying to resist apartheid, and now they're all being killed, and that's bad, that's horrifying, yikes. That said, number nine on my book list is Middlemarch by George Eliot. This year, Middlemarch is the only novel in my top 10. I don't think that's ever happened before, but I was really reading history and autobiographies and revolutionary literature and things like that this year. But Middlemarch is so good. Oh my gosh. I was obsessed with it from start to finish. It's so long, but I just wanted to stay in Middlemarch. I was so happy to just keep reading it. It's no wonder that it's considered one of the best books of all time by so many. Everybody should read it. George Eliot, she is a legend. Speaking of excellent books, we're gonna go to number eight on the list, which is Black Boy by Richard Wright. I was on a Richard Wright kick this year. I read Black Boy, I read Native Son, I read The Outsider, and I read The Man Who Lives Underground, and they're all so good, but Black Boy is his autobiography. If you're gonna read it, make sure you get the full extended edition because it went up because when it was originally published, they cut out like the second half of it because there was like some communist stuff that he mentioned there. The uh, publishers in the US back then would not have liked that at all, but I liked it at all. Number seven, we're talking about Women, Race, and Class by Angela Davis. This book should be required reading in the United States and other places as well. Why not? It's so good. It left me at the end of it boiling with a righteous fury, which I think is so important. I think we need books that make us very mad because when you read something like that, that's gonna motivate you to take active steps to be against uh, the patriarchy and racism and the rich and capitalism and things like that. Folks, it's so good. Mm, you don't understand. And I'll tell you something else you don't understand. Number six on my list is The End of Policing by Alex Vital. Shout out to Ted Cruz for holding this book up at one point to complain about it. And I saw it and I was like, that looks interesting. It is interesting. It's a great book. It's actually, I feel like the title of the book is just like a really clickbait title because when you actually read it, it is so solution focused and it's so logical and the chapters are broken down so perfectly. You get a chapter on like homelessness and how the, the police are stretched so thin trying to deal with this problem that shouldn't be theirs. You get this chapter on the drug war and how drugs won that 
war and how maybe that should be viewed as a health issue, not a crime issue, and why it was viewed as a crime issue because the police force is rooted and founded in racism. Look, I was in China recently. Their cops don't carry guns. Like, do you know how chill that is when you see a cop? It's like, oh man, there is like no chance that they would pull me over for a traffic stop and then decide to shoot me. Uh, number five on the list is Asata, an autobiography by Asata Shakur. This book is incredible. This woman is incredible. Let me tell you about her. Uh, she is falsely accused of killing a state trooper. She uh, goes to trial, she goes to prison, and uh, so she escapes prison. And she flees to Cuba and lives there to this day. And she's a legend and a hero. And everybody should read that book. Anytime she wrote the word America, she replaced the C in America with a K. And I just loved that. You can't blame her. Read the book. You can't blame her for not liking the United States after what they did to her. In fourth place, Washington Bullets by Vijay Prashad. This was another book that left me absolutely boiling with rage. It is one that takes a look at everything that the US has done through their imperialism to uh, crush people's revolutions and crush socialism and communism in other countries and here at home. And it really makes it clear that, hey, socialism is not some system that fails because it doesn't work everywhere it's been tried. Socialism is a system that fails because the U.S. actively gets involved in messing it up because the U.S. looks at that as being against capitalist interests, which are profit for shareholders, not profit for the people. So read that book and feel some of that rage and it's wonderful. The nice thing about Washington Bullets is it's so short. It's a nice little tiny little skinny little scrawny book and I love that. I think revolutionary literature should be short and uh, sweet and it's the best way. In third place, I read Don't Forget Us Here by Mansoor Adaifi. And oh, this is the most devastating book I may have ever read. Don't Forget Us Here is the story of innocent men who were taken prisoner after 9-11 and tortured by the U.S. in Guantanamo Bay. Yes, the U.S. has actively taken part in torture for decades of innocent men. The author, he was a student, who was kidnapped by a gang and the gang sold him to the United States claiming that he was a terrorist. That book will wreck you, but it is still so good. There's resilience in it and there's hope buried in there and it's a necessary read. If you're walking around really feeling good about the US, I think you need to read this. <sighs> The more that I read this stuff, the more that I realize that the U.S. is the villain. <sighs> I need to tell you all about this next book, okay? Because this next book is the best book that I've read this year, somehow, and it's in second place. I read Fidel Castro, My Life, a spoken autobiography by Fidel Castro. This book is massive. It is beautiful. I read it right at the start of 2023. And this is the book that turned me into a socialist. If I hadn't read this book, I might have still been a liberal right now. Ugh. This book is set up interview style. So it's an interviewer having a conversation with Fidel Castro. So easy to read. You get lost in this book and just go. Fidel Castro is incredible. In my personal opinion, I loved it. I think everybody should read it. I think so. I do. And you're sitting here thinking he loves this book so much. It's his favorite book of all time. How is it in second place? Because there was a better book that I read this year. And the number one book that I read this year is One Day in December, Celia Sanchez and the Cuban Revolution by Nancy Stout. And the reason why this book is the number one book of the year is because uh, it's the best book. <laughs> <laughs> Celia Sanchez is so cool. She's very well known in Cuba, but not as well known outside of Cuba like Fidel and Che are. So I think that more people need to read this one and learn about her and just all the iconic stuff that she did because she basically organized this underground of like different farmers across the, the farmlands of Cuba and she got Fidel and the, the liberation fighters. She got them from landing on Cuban soil up into the mountains where they were trying to get. She was able to transport them. She had like supply lines and things set up. She went to the front lines and fought in battles alongside Fidel. She's just such an icon. Oh, 
That book is so well written too. Nancy did an incredible job. I love it so much. I love it. This is one of the few books that I got from the library and I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna buy it just so that I can have it on my shelf because it was that good. Celia Sanchez, we will never forget all that you have done for the world and Cuba. That's the list. Those are the good books that I read this year. Did I read bad books this year, you ask? Yes, I did, and I'd be happy to tell you a little bit about them. So I read this book this year called 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami. That book is huge. It's like over a thousand pages long, and I got about 700 pages in and saw the most horrifying thing of my life, which was the author going so far out of his way to justify blatant pedophilia. It was sickening what he was writing about. Basically, there's this woman who goes and kills evil dudes, you know, dudes who are nasty. So yeah, she's going to kill this guy because like, of course, she's heard that he's doing stuff with children. And then the book is like, no, they're not actually children. They're like the shadow version of these children. And actually these children worship him. And he has this condition where like sometimes his joints all freeze up and he can't move. And whenever that happens, his whatchamacallit gets really amped up. And when that happens, these little like shadow girls come in and they do this to him when he can't really move. So he doesn't want to do this, but it's just like he's forced to. Don't get me wrong, he's still absolutely busts every time that they do this to him so but like you know he doesn't get any pleasure out of it or anything and uh, specifically what the hell and what the fuck and the book had already annoyed me because like earlier on in the book there's this kind of criticism of communism and I just thought the whole thing was laughable. It's trying to portray communism as like this hive mind where nobody can have any original thought. At the end of that it says something like some people think that this is okay to ensure that nobody starves. And I'm sitting there like, uh, dude, if nobody starved, hell yeah, that would be freaking awesome. Are you kidding me? I don't understand how that's like a selling point of capitalism, that people are starving to death. Oh yeah, you have the freedom to be a wage slave and people are also starving to death, but you have that freedom. So just think about that, it's awesome. For some reason, I, I buckled down and I read that entire book even after at 700 pages in. I feel like maybe that was part of it. I made it 700 pages in and I'm like, I can't just stop now, can I? And um, the book taught me a lesson, which was that, yes, you can stop now. <laughs> even if you're at 700 pages in, you can always stop now. And so I, I practiced that for the rest of the year. Some of the other books that I noped on were Ulysses by James Joyce, that famous modernist epic. I just wasn't following it. Didn't care for it, just stopped reading it. That's my power now. I don't have to read books all the way through anymore. If I don't like them, I can just stop. I tried to read Freedom by Jonathan Franzen. At the start, I was really into it. And then just gradually, I got less and less into it. And more and more started to think Jonathan Franzen is an asshole. And then I tried to read some Jim Carrey book. It was called like Memoirs and Misinformation. Oh, that book was lame, dude. I think as a general rule, maybe we shouldn't read books that are just written by celebrities. Uh, that said, I did read Jeanette McCurdy I'm Glad My Mom Died, and that book absolutely did slap. I read a lot of Ann Tyler books this year. I read like four or five of them. Super fun. I actually have been reading some of those Carl Ove books, his autobiography series, and I've read book two, book three, and book four, and let me tell you something. I hate Carl Ove so much. I hate his dad even more, but somehow I can't stop reading the books. A couple more honorable mentions, because why not? I'm already doing it. I read Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom, and my gosh, that book is so good. I feel like if there's one criticism of it, it runs a bit long. But you know what? He went maximalist on it, and he delivered. I read this book called Why Fish Don't Exist. The thing that I like about that book is that it, it kind of gave me this new outlook on life. Specifically, it talked about the concept of people having positive thoughts and even self deluding themselves in positive ways and how that actively was better for their health. So somebody just thinking to themselves like, I'm smart, is going to have a better time and be healthier. That's kind of why religion can be so beneficial for people because it gives them uh, maybe that that hope, that assurance. And so I was like, I need to have positive thoughts and self delusions. Even if I know that they're delusions, I need to delude myself in positive ways for my health. White Teeth by Zadie Smith. Super fun read. I think um, anybody could read that and just have a good time. That'll be the tea. 
And that'll be the video too. I think I'm good. I think I'm done talking about it. I've filmed for 26 minutes. Oh no. Please subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, and come back next week to subscribe, like the video, and leave a comment as well when I will have another video. And it will be better than this one. I guarantee it. See ya.